Good morning, Digital Cathedral family. Glad you're with me on this Sunday morning. I hope you're all strapped in, ready to go, because once we blast off this morning, we're just going to keep chopping wood all the way through for the next, I don't know, 45 minutes or so. So I want you to stick with me and listen closely, because I'm going to put a lot of information out this morning, a lot of truth, and for many of you, it's going to be an overload of revelation. We're going to talk about the power of the Christ within. This is the second part. I did part one last week. I'm going to do, this is just a, a short three-part series to make us become extremely aware and conscious of the Christ within and then how to live out of that Christ power. Perhaps the greatest discovery that you can make as a believer, as a Christ follower, is to discover the Christ that is within. You remember what Paul said? I quote him all the time. Because for me, that was, this was a life-changing scripture. It's one of those game changers that once you see it, you can't unsee it. And once you see it, you look back on your life and say, I, I recognize that. What Paul is saying is true, but I was taught so opposite of it, it was impossible for me to recognize. It's what Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, verse 15 and 16 when he said this. He said, when it pleased the Father who separated me from my mother's womb, to reveal the Christ that is within me, right? That I might preach him among the Gentiles. To reveal the Christ that was in me. For, for me, it's mind-boggling to understand that the Christ was always within us because most of us were raised with the idea that you had to in, invite the sky God to come and indwell you. We weren't sure how this Christ thing fit all in. We just wanted Jesus to be our personal Savior. So to understand the, the power of the Christ that is within was never really explored. Paul said it a little differently over in Colossians chapter 1, verse 26, 27. He said, church, I want you to understand that there is a mystery that has been hidden from ages and from generations, but is now being revealed to the saints. Aren't you glad this morning he reveals things to the saints? That's you. That's me. He, re he continually reveals things to us. He's still revealing. What Paul told the Colossians, and I'll tell you in just a minute, he still is still revealing the depth of it today. He told the Colossians, he said, look, this mystery that has been hidden is now being manifest to the saints, and the mystery is this. He said that we can go and tell the Gentiles that it's Christ in you. Now, that just fits in so well with what he said in Galatians chapter 1, that the Christ within us was in the Gentiles. The Gentiles were looked upon as those that were non-believers, right? They, they were not intimate followers of Christ. So Paul is saying very explicitly that the Christ is in those Gentiles. Now this morning as I, as I get into this, I, I just want to give a couple caveats because I don't want you to hear something that I'm not saying. This morning, I'm not, I don't want to come across that I am um, diminishing the man Jesus. Jesus Christ, listen to me carefully, Jesus is 100% human, and he's 100% divine. Now, in my thinking, in my thinking, I can see this is the way that I digest it. I see that Jesus is 100% human, born of Mary, but I see that the Christ is 100% deity. Now, let me just be very plain. Listen to me. You really can't separate the two. The two are joined together, and they're inseparable. You can't separate uh, Jesus from Christ any more than you can separate your spirit from your soul. Hebrews 4.12 says that it's impossible to separate, and it's only the word that God speaks to you that can show you what is soul and what is spirit. So what I want to do this morning, just for the sake of the teaching, just for some clarification, I want to, I want to look at Jesus the flesh man and Christ that was the word that was made flesh, just for some clarification. Then we'll, we'll put the two back together again, and we'll talk about how they, they are empowered together in the same way that you are empowered as a human with a divine nature. See, Jesus, Jesus is the patterned son. Jesus is 
The Father's view of us. You want to know what the Father thinks about you? Look at Jesus. Jesus was given to us as an exact replica uh, of how we are to be. <clears throat> He's the pattern of which every other son has been cut out. And it was through this flesh walk of Jesus, his crucifixion, resurrection, that you and I in our minds have been totally reconciled back to God and should be no separation in our thinking anymore so that we're able to see now the Christ that dwells within us that Paul said was a mystery. So your spirit is divine, right? It, your spirit is the partaker of the divine nature. Now, I think Jesus recognized a little bit of the separation of the two when over in Matthew chapter 26, uh, Jesus said this. So uh, we're, we're just going to look at some things this morning that I want you to consider. And like always, don't believe it just because I say it. <laughs> because I'm on a journey, brother. I'm, a, I'm, I'm in hot pursuit of truth. So what I'm teaching you this morning is I get more clarification, more light, more understanding. I'm going to bring it to you. I'm not, I don't drive stakes down. Theology to me has got to be very fluid if you're growing. The only people that have theology nailed down and refuse to budge off of it are people that are stuck. People that are not growing. At the Digital Cathedral, we grow. We're on a journey. We share together our, our journey this we We learn more and more. Jesus did a little separation on this. In Matthew chapter 26 and uh, in verse 41, he said, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Now listen to this. He said, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, I, I just read that verse. I don't, I'm not going to get into the verse. I just read the verse so that Jesus, you can see, draws a distinction between flesh and spirit, between that which is natural and that which is supernatural, between that which was born of, of, a, of a woman, the humanness of it, and then the spirit, the, the part of us that's divine. Jesus sometimes, I think even Jesus in, in his walk, in his human walk, recognized himself uh, as man and Christ. In fact, he said, he, said, he said more than one time, he called himself son of man and called himself son of God. Now what Jesus learned to do, and what, I, what I'm trying to get at this morning, is because he's the pattern. We can do this too. Jesus learned to wholly live from the Christ part of himself. Son of God, Son of Man. He was very conscious of the Father that was the very center of his being, and he lived as God in the flesh. He was the Word made flesh. No doubt about it. He's God in the flesh. The Father was always bubbling up from within Jesus, right? Inspiring him motivating him, directing him, speaking to him. And Jesus said that that same bubbling up would direct us. He said in John chapter 7 and verse 38, he said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Not a trickle. When I, when I hear that word flow, and I really didn't, I didn't do a word study on it, I probably should have. But when I, when I picture a flow, I see this big pipe. And water just gushing from it. It's, it's not, it never ends. It doesn't slow down. It just keeps flowing out of your belly, out of, out of the inner por portion of us, out of the spirit man, out of that part of us that is divine nature. The wisdom of God, the understanding of God, the power of God, it just continually flows. Son of God, son of man. You're a human, but you're, you're not a human. <laughs> You're a new creation, brother. And as we, as we learn these new creation realities, we're understanding more and more what we do have and what we possess. Jesus, I think Jesus was laying it out when he said, Come unto me, all you that labor, heavy laden. I'll give you rest. He wasn't pulling people to his personality. He wasn't pulling people to his humanness. He was pulling people and speaking about and inviting People that were heavy laden, worn out. I think he's, I'd have to look it up, but I think he's probably speaking to religious people in particular. You're worn out doing good. You're worn out trying to keep the law. He said, just get to this Christ part of me. Come to me. He said, and I'll teach you how to rest. Once you discover the Christ part, look me in the eye. Once you discover the Christ part of you, you can enter into rest. Let the peace of God, 
which passes understanding, bypasses your mind. Guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Discovering the Christ within, our human self then gets a direction. When you discover, as Paul did, the Christ that is within, and he laid it out for all the saints, Christ is within us. We need to tell the Gentiles, Christ is within you. Man, that is such good news. I wish I could, I wish I could proclaim that from every pulpit in America and just look at, at vast congregations of people that have no idea that Christ is within them because all they've, all they've heard is the exact opposite. It's always the carrot just in front of us that we're trying to strive and we're trying to get to. We're trying to please him. We're trying to, we're trying to find this life that just escapes us continually. And we're asking this sky God to come and illuminate us when the illumination, the light has been within us the whole time. We just didn't know it. But when you discover the Christ that is within, it will lead you to rest. It will lead you to know that his life lies within you. And I don't know what you're finding out, but here's what I'm discovering. The more I discover my union with him, no separation. I've been teaching that for, for over 20 years now. But can I tell you that that understanding is still expanding, it's still growing? I guess Paul was really right. It's going to take the ages to come for us to explore the depths and the riches of his love and his grace toward us in Christ Jesus. Man, this is an exciting journey. Back when, I, back when I was teaching for years and years and years and had, had a theology pretty cut, pretty dry, I knew what I believed. It really, honestly, it got a little bit uh, boring and it was irritating because people couldn't catch it. This is an exciting journey, y'all. Or as we say in Texas, all y'all. This is an exciting journey. It's a continual exploration. It's a continual discovery. As you, as you grab onto this Christ life that is within, it helps you to yield. Yielding is not, a, is not a struggle. It's not a fight anymore. It helps you to yield. And not only do you find the peace within, you find the life that is within. And that life begins to flow. And that's what flows out of you to other people. Here's what I'm trying to say this morning. That like Jesus, we can rise out of the mortal part of us. Jesus rose above and lived out of the, the, the divine part of his being. They were so merged together, we cannot separate it. Jesus rose above it. And that, that, that same part of, of deity that resides within us, the Christ in us, the power that is within us, that can rise up and that can begin to lead our life in everything that we do. See, that mortal part of us, our, that, that, that soulish part that has been so well groomed and taught, that's where sickness comes, that's where depression arises, that's where separation and sorrow, all those things arise out of that lower being. Let's agree on something this morning. Can we do this? Let's agree. And our, our level of understanding of this is going to be in all, all different places. Some of you are new to the Digital Cathedral. Some of you have been with me since we started five years ago. But let's just come to a place this morning and say, okay, this is a fact. This is true. That the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, man, I feel the life on this. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. And as you recognize that Spirit of, of resurrection, that dunamis, that explosive power that is within you, it will give life. It will take the Zoe of God and it will, it will place it within that, that human part so much that it's overshadowed. That's how Jesus lived. Jesus lived in a place where, where the deity that he was fully overshadowed and directed the human part. See, we can draw out of the Christ part. We can live out of that deity that dwells within us. Uh, we can live out of the real eternal self and move consciously into his rest, which is where he directs us in all things. Let's come up to the realization this morning. We really are one with the Father. There is no degree of separation. And that because, because of that, our perception changes. The lens through which we look at now changes. And we see with his eyes. We perceive with his understanding. 
when we know that we know that we know that we were, are one with him, that you know what you're going to see? You're going to see that God is only good. He's only good. I, I love the way James said it. James, in some parts of James, he was, he was writing to Jewish believers. James chapter 1, the first few verses says, James, an apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ, under the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. So there's no question James wrote his book to Jews. But I, I, I like the way he brings some nuggets in. See, James, Peter, James, and John were transitioning, no doubt about it. They, they were steeped in law. Paul was the grace guy. Paul was the radical, hyper, <laughs> over-the-top grace dude. And sometimes they had a little bit of trouble grabbing onto Paul. So you can see some mixture in the writing of Peter, James, and John because they were evolving. So if you're going to take this and believe that every single word was divinely inspired and infallible and full absolute truth, you got to be jacked up because you're going to find that some of this was not written to us. It wasn't written to believers. It was written to Jews. But in instructing the Jews, he said this, verse 17, chapter 1. Every good gift, every perfect gift comes from above and comes down from the Father of lights, no darkness in him, no deception in him, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. So here's what I'm trying to get, here's, here's what I'm trying to say on this particular point. That when you start living out of the Christ within, you start to see how good the Father is. Have you noticed that? The, one of the, the glaring differences between you and the people back at the church that you probably came out of, or some of you still attending the church, but you're there for the fellowship and your friends, but you're seeing that your whole perception of the lens that you see the Father through is totally good, where they're seeing the Father as not being a perfect replica of Jesus. So James caught a hold of that. There's no evil in him. There's no darkness in him. He said no variation of turning. He's not one way one day and one way the next. He said it like this in, in verse 13. He said, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, nor does he tempt anybody. Nobody's tempted of God. You know how you're tempted? He's going to tell you. Each one is tempted when he's drawn away of his own desires and enticed. So the best time to cut off temptation is when you feel that drawing away from the Christ that is within to maybe what your mind is saying. This, this doesn't have to be something uh, perverse, evil, or robbing a bank or killing somebody. This is just about making choices see, that miss the target. And when you miss the target, harmony it's sin. The wages of that oftentimes is is a death or a sense of being disconnected. It doesn't mean you're going to physically die. It means now there is a sense of disconnect. Remaining fully Christ conscious resolves that, resolves that separation. It keeps us in divine contact, spirit-to-spirit -spirit connection. Many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. If we through the Spirit mortify the deeds of the flesh, we live. See? So you just, you just cut it off because when it develops... When desire has conceived, it brings sin. And when sin is fulfilled, the wages of sin is what? Death. It brings forth death. But that's, none of that has to do with God. Everything he has is ours. And it brings rest to our soul, to the human part of us. Let me hit it from just a different angle. Your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions are the human part of you. And they're strong. They ha that's what we've learned is to make good decisions out of, out of our logic and out of our resources. It's the soulish part of man, mind, will, and emotions. Nothing wrong with a strong will. Nothing wrong with emotions if they're directed by spirit. But the soulish part of us is our mind, our will, and our emotions. The spirit is the eternal part. The Spirit is the image and the likeness of God. Now, your flesh has no, no power. Your flesh does not make decisions. Do you understand that? When the Scripture talks about flesh, it's talking about the directives of the mind, the will, and the emotions. Flesh has no power. Flesh has no ability. Flesh makes no decisions. The flesh, if you remember nothing else this morning, I want you to remember this.
The flesh makes action. The flesh obeys the soul or the spirit, whichever is the strongest. The human part, the mind, the will, and the emotions, or the spirit, which is image and likeness of God, very life of God, resurrection power residing within, whichever part is the strongest, the flesh will obey. And there are times you can sit down and watch. You're, you're looking for making a decision. And you know, you know God's speaking to you about this. Man, it's not logical. It doesn't seem to make sense. It, you're, you don't want to do it like that. And so you, got, you can feel the tension of the two back and forth. You can feel the pull of the Spirit. You can feel the tug of, of the emotions, the will, the mind. So whichever one you yield to, <clears throat> your flesh will obey. So whichever one you've cultivated, whichever one is stronger. When we begin to live by spirit, we have to make up ground. We have to begin to spend time in spirit, time in meditating, time in union with the Father, time in recognizing our, our place with him. Because the balance is, balance, when you first begin to do this, your soulish power is up here and, you, and, and your little bitty spirit down here. But as, as, as you progress in this, you mature as a son, and as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God until finally there's only one voice you hear. You don't longer hear the voice of the mind, the will, and the emotions. You're, you're glued, you're, 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 you're focused in on what the Spirit is saying. The power of the Christ that is within. Jesus was always trying to get the minds of the people away from his personality, away from his flesh, and fix them on the Father as the source of everything they needed, the source of all the power for every work, every walk. And that culminated when he told them something that would ultimately move their focus from his physical presence. And at first, I think it blew them away. It, it, it put them on tilt. They didn't like it. They didn't want to hear it. But Jesus was hell-bent on moving their focus off of him personally, his personality, his physical being. Let, let, me, let me read to you what Jesus said here. In John chapter 16, John chapter 16. Man, this is good stuff this morning. This, this cranks me up. It's, it's probably a little deep, maybe for some of you that are new to Digital Cathedral, but just hold tight. Some of the things I'm saying, you say, I don't, I don't understand it. I, I can teach it to you, but I can't understand it. But what will help your understanding is just crockpot it. I, I teach things that you have to crockpot, not microwave. And until the Spirit reveals it to you, you're not going to catch it. But once you catch it and see it, it's set, it's set in place for life. Right? So Jesus is trying to move their, their attention off of him and onto the Father. He said, so he says this, John chapter 16, verse 5. He says, I go away to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. You're, 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 up, you're upset with me. You're sad because I'm not going to be here. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. If I depart, I will send him to you. Now, if Jesus remained, this is why it was an advantage to them. Jesus said it's an advantage. It's to your benefit if I go. I'm sure he said they were sorrowful. They didn't get it. They didn't understand. Why was it an advantage? It fits in with exactly what I'm teaching you this morning. If Jesus remained they would have continued to look to him for every need to be met. That was not the Father's plan. That was not the Father's desire. That was not the intention of Jesus coming. I think the same, if Jesus was still here today, we would be the same way. We would be looking to him to give us the loaves and fish. We would be looking to him to open the eyes of the blind. We'd be looking to him to tell us how to get the coin to pay the taxes. That was not the Father's plan. So Jesus sets their spirit eyes on what was going to take place 
that they could produce out of the kingdom, out of the, out of the Christ's power that was within them. So that he could be multiplied all over the planet. He's the, he's the pattern son, first born among many. And now you and I are just starting in this generation to tap into the idea that we don't have to pray and ask Jesus to come do it. We don't have to ask a, a, a distant God to come with his presence and surround us. In, in verse 15, Jesus says this, same chapter. All things that the Father has are mine. Right? So he's, he's got the source of it. The Christ, Jesus Christ. Jesus, the natural man, did not have everything. It was the Christ that was within him. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and will declare it to you. And in declaring it to you will bring understanding that you too can tap into what I've always tapped into because the Father has given to me all things. <laughs> That's deep. That's powerful. So you have access to all things. So Jesus said, it's to your advantage that I go away. Because if I don't go away, you're only, you're only going to look to me. And I can only be in one place at one time meeting one set of needs. But now, through the digital cathedral and other ministries like it, people all over the world are beginning to awaken to the power of the Christ within and seeing that this life, this, this flow can come out of us and that we can focus on it. Unfortunately, the evangelical church, the church that most all of us came out of, still look to a source outside themselves. They're looking to a man for an answer. They're looking to the sky god for an answer, or a ministry, or a set of seps. They're, they're, every week they're going somewhere and they're saying, if you would just show us the secret sauce, <laughs> if you just show us the steps to take. You ever notice how many, how many messages you've come through? And I did so many of them. Three steps to victory, four steps to answered prayer. Do these nine things and God will meet your needs. That's a bunch of hogwash, right? He's teaching us to tap into the source. The secret, the secret sauce that people want, Jesus gave to us. Here's Jesus' secret sauce. You want Jesus' secret sauce? Let me give you the secret sauce to Jesus. Luke chapter 17. Back up a little bit to your left. You know, it's good if you have your Bible with me at the digital cathedral. You know, I could do like a lot of teachers do, it, and I could print the verses out so I could just read them. But there's something about looking it up in your book. I, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's still part of me that's, that's old school. I like reading out of my Bible to you. And I read out of New King James. I, I read a lot of translations. Sometimes I use other ones. But it, it, it's good for you to get your Bible. I hope you read your Bible. I hope you read your Bible. It's important. Is it infallible? Is it inerrant? No. But what you'll find is that it's very inspired. You know, when you're reading it, the Spirit of Truth will bring up something to your, to your thinking, to revelation, that you're not even seeing in the book. It's kind of like when you read, uh, there are a lot of inspired books today. Same, same inspiration that inspired this or inspiring writers today. I see tons of revelation when I read books. No doubt about it. But this is a good book. The good book. That's, that's a good name. All right, here's Jesus' secret sauce. Are you ready? We, we're always looking for the secret sauce, looking for the magic formula. All right, he's going to give it to us. Luke chapter 17, and let's begin with verse 20. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, they're looking outside. They're looking to some distant place. Jesus answered and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. It's not out yonder someplace. People are still looking for it out here. They're still looking for Jesus to come bring a kingdom. It's not going to happen that way. Nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, here's the secret sauce of Jesus. So simple. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you and with that kingdom comes everything that the father possesses now that's going to require a mind shift 
I understand it's going to require some, some conscious changes, an elevation of your consciousness, where you're not looking to profit so-and-so to give you the word that's going to tell you exactly what to do and where to go and how to do it, when to do it. That's the job of the Spirit of Truth, my friend. I don't come to the digital cathedral as the ultimate authority to tell you what to do or not to do. I come to inspire you to, to hear for yourself. My goal is to bring you the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ, and I'm not going to be able to do that if every Sunday you just show up to see what I have to say and take what I have to say as absolute truth. Don't you dare do it. I ain't your ultimate spiritual authority. The Christ that is within is. That's what I, I'm teaching on, the power of the Christ within you. Because like Jesus, I'm, I'm telling you, there's going to be a time to your advantage that I ain't going to be here. Then what are you going to do? What, what are you going to do when, you're, when Pastor Favorite is no longer in your life? If he hasn't taught you how to get it for yourself, Jesus is showing them how to get it for themselves. <clears throat> All right, let's, let's read on. The kingdom of God is, is within you. So let me, let me make it real plain. Any ministry, any preacher, any teacher who tries to get you hooked to them, tries to give you the ultimate formula to follow, to receive, to be blessed, he said, do not follow them verse, in verse 23. Don't do not follow them. Don't give heed to them. Why? Because verse 21, he says that the kingdom is within you. That, my friend, is the, is, is the secret sauce of Jesus. Don't get tied to a teacher. Don't get tied to people. Because there are plenty that will tell you this is how it goes. This is how it breaks down. This is what you must do. Hear me, hear me. And they build the kingdom around themselves rather than the kingdom that is within. See, Jesus left and connected us. Thank God, man, he connected us to the same plot supply that he was connected to, which comes through spirit truth and that channel that Jesus said was living water that flowed out of our innermost being. So the gospel basically is this, man. This is the entryway into the whole thing. The gospel is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. And it's quickening your mortal body. How much quickening do you want? That's an old English word that means give life to. How much do you want? You can get all you want. Immortality is possible. Oh, boy. We'd like to get into that. See, what we're, what we're now, we're part of a generation that's beginning to see this. We're beginning to tap into it. We're beginning to see this unending supply. We're beginning to see that we don't have a checkbook. What we have is a combination to the safe down at the bank. Which one do you want? You want a checkbook from somebody that says, do these three steps? To victory, these four steps to prayer. Yeah, it'll work on some level, probably. It'll take you to one place, but there is an unending supply. There is a revelation that never ceases. There is a power that lies within you that you can fully tap into, just as Jesus did, by spending time with the Father and hearing the voice within. Not difficult. This isn't rocket science. He didn't make this so hard that you have to study theology for 20 years and get a PhD to grasp it. You have the combination to the safe down at the bank. And he just told us in John chapter 17 that the kingdom is within us. That means you have to begin to move your consciousness within. You, you begin to hear that perception that is within. And you can, we all can hear it. You sit down and be quiet. You'll begin to hear the rumbling that is within. All right, I'm, I'm going I'm to give you about 10 more minutes. I want you to listen very closely because this will change your life. There's a huge difference between living a Christian life and living a Christ life. Listen, to live a Christ life means you follow and do the teachings of Jesus 
with full understanding and awareness of the presence of God that is within you. And that that presence of God that is within you always emanates love, life, power. And it's within you. It's resurrection power. And that resurrection power that is within you is always ready to bring to the surface abundance. The kingdom is your Garden of Eden. Everything that you need ever for life and godliness, Peter said, you already have through the promises that he has given to you. Now, let me just, ex let me just extract the promises from the book. <clears throat> He's going to, if you spend time, he will give you promises that aren't word for word in the book. Man, those are the ones that once you grab onto, nobody can take away from you, right? Given to you everything pertaining to life and God is according to his promises. The Christ is us life means that you immerse yourself in union with him. I, I, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about this fact that I need to spend more time with him than I do reading books. And I'm, I'm a reader, man. I read wide. I read a lot of different stuff. Not all of it I believe, not all of it I grab onto. I'm not afraid to read. But I'm understanding that at some point, you're going to have a basic understanding of what truth is, how to tap into it. And it's from there that you're going to need to spend a lot more time with him while he speaks to you. He will show you things to come in your life, life of your family, your children. That's where wisdom comes from, brother. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. I can dispense knowledge, and I think Sunday mornings at Digital Cathedral, we put out a lot of knowledge. I, I think we put out life and revelation. But wisdom is when you're able to take what we talk about here at the Digital Cathedral, take it before the Father, and he breaks it down for you, begins to show you, and then you obey it. You just respond to it. Living the Christ life means you no longer see any separation. That immediately when a problem comes, you're not looking to a God out there. You go within for the solution and the answer. Living the Christ life means there's no guilt, no condemnation. You mess up, you fall up. You don't back out for six months until you repent in sackcloth and ashes and beg God to forgive you. There is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And you're in Christ Jesus. So cut it off at the passers. Barney says, nip it in the bud when it comes on you. The Christ is us life rests in confident assurance that he's speaking to you his direction. He's speaking to you his destination. He's showing you everything that you need to know at that given time. All right, now that's the Christ life. The Christian life is a life basically that you live from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A Christian life looks like this, and this is where most of us live. It's self-determining based on what we perceive as good and evil. And we choose good over evil. It examines and it chooses. It makes a choice. The Christian life centers on, free, uh, on a free will, where you always hold the trump card. You're able, to make the, you're able to make the decision. So the, the, the Christ life lives from within, and the, and the Christian life lives from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. <clears throat> the soul feeds the mind information by what it sees, what it hears, what it perceives. And then you make a decision and choice based on that. You try to do good and not evil. That's what the law was all about, trying to have people do good and not evil. There was nothing evil, Paul said, about the law. What is evil about the law? Nothing. The Christ life, on the other hand, already got the Christian life, it, it perceives and makes a choice. The Christ life responds. It perceives, it listens within, and then it responds, it acts, it obeys on what it perceives. That means that the Christ life is not subject to logic and reasoning like the Christian life. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the tree of logical choice. It's the tree of reason. The Christ life obeys and it responds. It may not be reasonable. It may not be logical. 
it was not reasonable and logical that I walk out of a building that I had in a, in a church I had built for 35 years and start to have a group called the Digital Cathedral that I had to start from ground level zero. It wasn't logical. It didn't make sense, but I responded. And I'm glad I did. Do I, do I miss that part? Yeah, I miss it a little bit. Sunday mornings, I miss being with my people. There's a, there's a dynamic, I'm not going to deny it, that comes from corporate gatherings. Who knows? I may do one here and there. In Houston, we need it. There's nothing in Houston that would, would meet that need. So the Christian life over here is basically make the father an advisor, but we still make the choice. We still have the trump card. Then when we make the wrong choice, we don't just live the Christ life and respond, but we make a decision, and we make a bad one, get ourselves in all kind of mess. Then we ask the Father to come bail us out. We get panicky. Father, come. you got to meet my need. You gotta, Father, you got to help me. The Christ life, the Christ is us life, needs no bailout or desperation prayer because it's simply responding. <clears throat> now, what if you miss it? What if you, you're trying to respond and you miss it? No problem. Because you're obeying and following, being led by the Spirit as the Son of God, the Holy Spirit, GPS, We'll take you down to the next corner, have you make a turn, and put you right back on path. The Christ life trusts the Father and leaves the results to Him. The Christian life makes what it feels is the most logical, good decision. And if it messes up, it asks God to come bail them out. See, our, our life... Here at the Digital Cathedral, we're at the point now I can just lay it on you straight and, and, and without any fluff. Our faith is centered on the Christ that is within. That means we live by the faith, not in Christ, but by the faith of Christ. That one little preposition that was rightfully interpreted in the King James of living by the faith of Christ and this is what Bible interpreters do. They, they become compatible with religion. So they change that of to in. So now that you and I live by faith in Christ, that puts the onus on us. The onus is not on us. It's on him, right? So we live by his faith. That's my, conf my confident assurance is in him. Abraham believed God and it was accounted him for righteousness. Abraham hoped against hope. That's what the Christ life does. The Christian life does not hope against hope. It makes decisions, and its, it's hope is based on the faith that I have in Christ. So if things don't work out, I blame myself for not having enough faith in him. <laughs> God help us. You can't live out of two sources, y'all. It has to be one or the other. We've been down that road. We've tried to live out of two sources. We've tried to live uh, a, a life of sonship, but still live a Christian life. Living a Christian life, asking God to direct us, but still holding back that final choice that seems right and seems good, doesn't seem evil, seems like, what, Je what would Jesus do? What? This will blow you away. What he directed Jesus to do in a particular situation may not be what he directs you to do in a particular situation. He directed Jesus to spit on the ground and make mud and put it on the man's eyes. He has never instructed me to do what Jesus did. So the WWJD is a cop-out. It's for me to make a choice to see what he did, then choose the same thing. The Christ life surrenders the self-decision-making capability. The Christian life centers on free will. The Christ life has no free will. The Christ life is a responder to His will as expressed to you from within, the kingdom that is within. And so as we get quiet we get, and we listen, 
we respond in agreement to the Christ within. The reason many have not done that and hold the card of freedom of will for themselves is because they're afraid to make a wrong choice. So out of panic, we, make, we used to make decisions of what seemed right because the Christ life was jumping off into a place like Abraham where we couldn't guarantee the results. But once you are living by the faith of Christ, you can guarantee the results because he's the guarantee. Wow. The Christ within has been there the whole time. That's what Paul tried to teach us. And millions of people are now awakening to that very fact. All right, I think that's a good place to stop right there. We're 45, 46 minutes in. Hope you got something from this. I laid a lot on you. Come back and listen to it again. There, there's nothing evil about listening to a teaching more than once. Nothing wrong with taking some notes. Nothing wrong with taking, and I encourage you to do this. Anything I teach, you take it to the Father and let him speak to you. And if what I'm telling you, he does not bear witness to or he says something different, believe him and not me. Believe him, not me. All right? Fair enough. But I think I gave you a whole lot in here, especially the comparison of the Christ life and the Christian life. All right, God bless you. See you Wednesday night at The Secret Place and next week back at the Digital Cathedral, 10 a.m. Central. Have a good one. If your heart has been touched by Don Keithley's words and you believe this ministry can enrich your spiritual journey, we warmly invite you to subscribe and hit the bell icon. By doing so, you'll stay up to date with all the new and inspiring content from the Digital Cathedral, ensuring you never miss out on the transformative power of God's love and grace. You may make a donation at donkeithley.com. We thank you for your continued support and encouragement.